Okay, so I apologize if I look terrible this morning. I taught a class and I did a show yesterday. My RA is acting up and I woke up to see the hashtag comics broke me trending this morning. And as I scrolled through, I really wanted to make a response to this. So I am also an artist that comics has broken. There is a somewhat meme phrase in comics that happened just half entirely wholeheartedly that comics will break your heart. And we don't mean the art form of comics will break your heart. We mean the industry will break your heart. So um, I realize some of you guys might be new here. You might not know who I am. I'm Becca Hilburn. I also go by Natto Soup. I am a comic artist with an MFA in comics from SCAD. I graduated in 2013. I have been in dozens of anthologies. I share my comic, Seven Inch Kara, which is technically a middle grade comic with a female protagonist who is coded to have ADHD. I share that at seveninchkara.com. I co-founded the comic collective Ink Drop Cafe, which has since dissolved. I co-founded How to Be a Con Artist. I have stepped away since. That is still ongoing on Tumblr. I have had my hand in more indie pots. I have back-ended more Kickstarters than I can count. I am also an art educator as a gig worker. I work with libraries. I have worked with schools. I have worked with community education. I have worked with private mini art houses. I have worked with um, art supply stores. I have done conventions, anime cons for over 10 years. I have done freelance for various companies. I am someone who has been involved in all sorts of aspects of the comic art industry and you've probably never heard my name and you probably never will. And to some extent, I'm okay with that. I've made peace with that. I'm 37 now. I've kind of accepted that I am going to live in nobody and I'm going to die in nobody. And I kind of just hope that the people who enjoy my er, my work while I'm on earth will tell me they enjoy it because my husband is gonna burn it all after I die by my request, as I've said a few times. So I wanted to speak, I wanted to share my experiences with Comics Broke Me. Um, a lot of better known, more established, more household names in terms of comics have been sharing their own really negative experiences. A lot of it boils down to horrifically overworked. I'm talking Japanese manga industry levels of overwork, health issues, burnout, really bad emotional mental health issues, and horrifically underpaid, like $24 a page of comics underpaid. That is a disgusting amount of underpaid. And uh, I wanna like second that that has also been my experiences. I have also seen those kind of pay rates. I have also seen that kind of pressure. Um, in terms of that kind of pressure, I have always had health issues, really, really, really bad migraines that they're, they're triggered by a few things, but that level of overwork will send me into a physical lockup for three days. So ever since basically three or four years out of grad school, I can't take those kind of jobs. I just physically cannot take those kind of jobs. So like, while I have some experience with the horrific turnover, I have had to watch more jobs, walk away and wonder if my life would be different and wonder if I would have a career because I have these underlying systemic health issues. So like, while I don't have the level of experience with taking those kind of grindy jobs, I've seen them come and go. I've had a lot of friends who have done those kind of jobs, who've gotten eaten up by those kind of jobs. And one of the love, one of the things I'm seeing, and I highly encourage you if you're interested in comics, is to check out the hashtag because people are being like real and honest. And I, I've been talking about this for over a decade now, and I've been being honest about it for over a decade now. And all it's gotten me is blacklisted. People don't want to work with me, and people have called me sour grapes for pointing out these issues. So. I am super happy people are brave and speaking out about this. It's always been my whole career in comics. It's been like an underlying thing, but no one wants to talk about it 
because it's so easy to get blacklisted. It's so easy for people to think you're just not worth working with. They're going to work with somebody who is less experienced and a little more naive that they can take advantage of. And um, I've like aged out of comics. So like at 37, as somebody who's never really other than like I have anthology work and I've done test pages and I've done pitches, I've done things like that. I have probably aged out because I am too old to be appealing for that. It's kind of like guys who only want to date women in their early 20s because they are women that they can control. They can't control me. I'm 37. My spouse earns the bulk of our income. I know better and my priorities have shifted. I have family members that I'm taking care of. I have I can't just kill myself for a company to to end up with pennies on the dollar and hating myself. But that doesn't mean I don't really relate and it doesn't make me feel like, like seeing a lot of them talk about their experiences and how bad they were. It doesn't make me feel like, it doesn't not make me feel like, in some ways I've dodged a bullet. Like I always wondered what could have been if I had taken those like really low paying, really grindy jobs for artists. If I'd taken more of those, if my friends had sent more of those my way because um, I have a lot of comic friends and a lot of them do do those kind of jobs, but they're not in a financial position where they can recommend my name or anybody else's name. They need all the work they can get because the, the scale of pay in comics for most artists is so low. It's not really a living wage. Most of us cannot be just comic artists. We have to be something else. And while I'm not over here like you're a failure of an artist if you have a day job if you have a day job and you like your day job that is fantastic keep your day job keep that stability keep if your boss treats you well keep that because I have found as a working I, I am a gig educator now and I have been for at least the past five years I have found that they always start taking advantage of me always it's always just a matter of time everyone I have worked with started out they really loved me they loved what I brought to the table they were so excited to offer comic stuff and then as the years progress they don't want to raise my increase my payment to keep up with inflation they don't understand why even if my class is so booked it is double booked like with some of the libraries I teach with now it is always booked up and there's always a wait list but they can't justify in paying me for the materials that I'm bringing in or they can't justify increasing my rate with inflation. This is an argument we have continually had where on paper they agree that they're going to do it and then it never happens and then they're apologizing that the checks don't reflect that. But it's like if you could apologize for that, you could just fix the checks. Um, so I feel like this is like something that is kind of endemic to the work of comics, which as I talked about in my I Hate Fine Art video, comics is not really considered a fine art. Um, so it's one of those weird things where a lot of people would like to learn how to draw. Like drawing is cool, drawing is a little bit like magic. So there's an aspirational aspect to it, but comics is also historically considered low brow. So at least in my field of gig teaching experience, it becomes very easy to start really taking it for granted. To start really being like, well, but you don't really need the brush pins for your class, right? Like we could go to Dollar Tree and get them mechanical pencils, right? That'll be good enough, right? Because like they're teenagers, right? They don't need like, you don't need that for them, right? And then I end up paying for it out of pocket. Or it becomes, well, you know, your class, you, it's a six week class and you're only getting paid $150 for all six weeks because you're getting paid half of what each student paid when they enrolled. That's my experience with NCE, okay? It was $60 to enroll for the class. I saw half of that money. NCE saw the rest. They are technically a not-for-profit. Some of their teachers were teaching pro bono because they were retired teachers in that field. Some of them taught for money. Um, and it was always an argument over payment with me. And it was always an argument over supplies for the class with me. And it was always an argument with getting them to promote the class on their social media platforms to help with signups. It was ever since the first iteration of that class, it always fell on me to do everything. I was providing so much of the supplies. I was printing everything out for them. I was printing out and helping them assemble all their zines. I was donating extra time to help them lay out their books. Like I laid out all their books for them, but 
NCE did not want to recognize anything I did. Uh, my class was at the end of the day, so the secretary had left for the day. So often they, I could not access like the, the projector, for example, like they wouldn't have the remote for me or they would have turned it off. Or the woman who taught the class before would have the heater cranked up so high that the projector was malfunctioning. And it was always just like, yeah, but you could teach in those circumstances anyway, right? Like, what are you, what are you teaching? You're teaching drawing. Or how many classes have I rolled up to where they didn't have a whiteboard for me, they didn't have a blackboard for me, they didn't have an easel for me, they didn't have anything for me to draw on, they didn't have a projector for me, and it was like, well, but you could teach anyway, right? And I mean, that isn't necessarily just comics, but I, I have to wonder, like, any other class, any other class that you have commissioned that you want that person to come in and teach, would you treat them this way? Would you do this? Would you make a cooking class teach without stoves? Would you change the scope of what you're willing to pay for and what you're willing to provide after the teacher has already agreed and after they've already signed a contract and after they've already started developing these classes? So I want to talk to you guys a little bit about my time at SCAD. So those of you who are familiar with me and what I do, um, I have been making comics like forever. I got into comics at 13 and I have been making comics since. And all through high school and undergrad, I was kind of making comics in a bubble, but I was making comics every single day. And that was kind of self-sustaining and I wasn't really even sharing them online. It wasn't until I went to SCAD that I really started making comics in a community and interacting with other people who specifically wanted to go into comics as a profession. And um, I was super excited to when I got into SCAD. Like I had just finished my BA in digital media at UNO, which does not have any kind of comics or illustration program. They were going to have an illustration program and then Hurricane Katrina destroyed all of that and I was already stuck. Um, I didn't have any other transportation and I already had a full ride scholarship there. So I went into digital media instead. And I was really excited when I got into SCAD and I was accepted on a one third scholarship which means academically, I, or <laughs> they pay for one third of, so the way SCAD works is you can technically have a full ride scholarship. That's pretty unusual. You have to be really stellar for that. I don't know. I don't know that I knew anyone who had a full ride, um, but they may have just not talked about it. Um, I had a one third and it was on academics. So my grades were really good. The theory was really good. My drawing skills needed improvement. A friend of mine was there, I believe, on artistic but not academics. So their drawing skills were really, really good, but their comics theory wasn't as strong. Their grades in undergrad hadn't been as good as mine. And then um, you could theoretically have a full ride scholarship. And while I was at SCAD, while I was at this school for making comics that was for more than 40% female, I have faced some of the worst misogyny and sexism I have faced in my entire life. And I grew up an ADHD girl in the 90s in Southeast Louisiana. And all of that is real misogynistic, really not pro women having their own life, having their own things, going into something like comics, really not. So it's, it's wild to hear those words. I had never faced misogyny like I saw at SCAD. Whether it was professors bringing in female strippers to be our models, but when we asked about having male models who actually had muscles on them um, so we could practice for drawing, you know, like superheroes, our professor asked our male classmates if they were interested in that and if they needed that and they said no, so we didn't get it to having a professor say that the re like me bringing up things like that and pointing out that that was sexist is the reason my fiance at the time wouldn't marry me. Said that in front of the whole class, all the guys laughed. Hey y'all, we're married now. Um, just that was like a daily occurrence or having a professor who would specifically pick on one student and break them as a person. And it's strangely, it was always a female student or a trans student that they would pick on. Oh, or, or the, oh boy, I'm not sure the terminology, the transphobia that was going on at SCAD during that time was like ridiculous, through the roof, disgusting. Um, and I would report it to the head of the department 
because a because I felt like this person was somebody who would like take that seriously and want to do something about it and I wanted to give them a chance I wanted to believe they would do the right thing this is someone who had a daughter and I wanted to believe this person would do the right thing and would want their daughter to be in an environment that didn't have those problems right um, and it got to the point where that professor told me that if all I did was complain all the time and I I this person was my mentor. This person, I TA'd for this person. I thought we had a really good relationship. Um, my dad had recently passed away, so I saw this guy as like kind of a father figure. I had a lot of respect for this person, and when he told me that if all I ever did was complain about all the sexism, no one would ever want to hire me. And I mean, he wasn't, that was my lived experience in comics. He was not wrong, but that gutted me. That told me it was more important that they keep quiet about what was going on then they address it and what kills me is the professors who were some of the worst in terms of misogyny and sexism and inappropriate sexual comments and um, just like really inappropriate ways of handling their students they're still there or for example female students could not it was really hard for us to find a female mentor in the department because there were only two female professors one of which was going through some stuff and the other was ten not tenured so she couldn't take on mentees at the time um, and our male professors basically had a policy they would take on male students as mentees but not female students because it might cause a scandal so we just didn't our needs just didn't matter they were not addressed it was not important to them and I mean, SCAD has its problems, and I'm usually really reticent to talk about SCAD because I worked really hard, I learned a lot, I don't want to devalue my degree. I do feel like the way I was treated there really negatively impacted my ability to advocate for myself, my ability to interact with other artists. Like, even though I have ADHD, I'd never had RSD before I went to SCAD. It wasn't until I was treated the way I was treated that I developed crippling RSD and um, it's impacted me for like, you know, ever, ever, ever since. And I'm still friends with some of the people I met while I was at SCAD. Um, I am sure they would agree, whether they would agree publicly with what I'm saying because this becomes always contentious or whether they would agree privately with what I'm saying. I think many of them had similar experiences or it got to the point where they could see what was happening because it, maybe it wasn't happening to them, but it happened in front of them enough that they started to see that it was happening. And I'll never forget that this male classmate that I had thought we were relatively close and I thought we'd really gotten along with messaged me on Facebook to tell me that the reason nobody would ever hire me was all I did was complain when I didn't even post on Facebook. I had tweeted a couple of times about the sexual harassment and the misogyny that had happened while I was at SCAD and that really got me because I was like I thought this was one of the good ones like I thought this was somebody who like got it and like even though he chose to hang out with these bad actors I thought he understood that they were bad actors and this was just this was so commonplace and part of the reason I bring this up is I was used as a Judas goat so while I was at SCAD for the two of the three years I was there, because I needed a little extra time. As somebody with ADHD, I needed to take two classes a semester to retain the information, and I took classes all year round. And I got, I got smacked for doing that as well. I was accused of not wanting it bad enough and not trying hard enough by my mentor professor because I wasn't taking three classes, because I was just taking two classes at a time despite having a disability. So super, super cool. Comics is, is very ableist. <laughs> Um, if you can't grind your body to a pulp and if you can't pick up on topics immediately, comics will grind you out. And I can't say that it's gotten better because I've had to step away and change how I engage with comics. But I was used as a Judas goat and what that means is because I used to dress very cute every day for class, that was my armor, that was and gave me confidence, it allowed me to get through the critiques. Um, I was always asked to give tours. I was asked to show parents around and explain to them, oh yeah, SCAD Seek was a safe place for your daughter. And at the time I said that I had not had those bad experiences, so I genuinely believed it. I'd had um, three 
really great professors who were just they I hadn't experienced those problems yet so I meant that sincerely when I told the parents that or they would have me talk to groups of girls who are into manga to talk about how like scat is changing and um you they're they're really gonna teach you what you want to learn except I went to SCAD right after the Tokyo Pop bust so all of our professors minus two were severely anti anti manga if you had a manga style they would ride you hard to get rid of that art style their going theory was you had to be the best of the best if you had any whiff of anime or manga to your art and Obviously, they were super wrong and times have drastically changed and it's due to buying power of people like me who those it's changed. They were also not into kids comics and they were very much not into comics with female protagonists. I only had a couple professors who were supportive of the fact that I wanted to go into kids comics and that I wanted to have comics with a female protagonist. Um, it was really pushing like, well, you should, and like, I'm sure some of my classmates had a different experience than I did. These are my experiences from critiques that I'd gotten from one-on-one -on -one sessions that I'd gotten that these are just my own experiences. And I don't want to mention any names one, because I'm not looking for a lawsuit. I'm not looking for slander. I'm not looking for libel. I don't know that I could prove a lot of like the misogyny, right? It's something that is felt and experienced and it's said, so it turned into what I said versus what they said. Also, I'm not necessarily trying to tell you not to go to SCAD. It has changed a lot. Some of the classmates I went to school with or who were right behind me are now professors and they are wonderful people. So SCAD and SCAD CEQA is really dependent on who the professors are at the time. I was just really unfortunate because like I said, Tokyo Pop had busted and they had decided that any kind of a manga influence was a death knell. And they were in this weird space where kids comics hadn't, Raina Telgemeier or Smile hadn't come out yet. We hadn't seen this resurgence of kids comics. Manga hadn't had its third boom yet because Tokyo Pop had kind of salted the water and kids comics just didn't exist. So what I wanted to make in comics just didn't, they could not fathom that. And web comics, while web comics was a thing and it was really growing, and in fact, some of the students who were there had super popular web comics and they are still very well regarded as comic artists. In general, that was seen as a fluke and they weren't going to encourage that. I was at SCAD from 09 to 13, so it was kind of a weird bubble and a lot was changing and some of them just didn't want to change with it. Um, but even though I learned a lot at SCAD and I got to meet a lot of editors and I got to learn a lot about networking, it really left a very negative taste in my mouth. It really taught me that there are a lot of people I don't want to work with. Um, a lot of my classmates would they themselves were very misogynist and sexist and it's real wild to see some of them on Twitter now acting like they're very pro woman when they were horrible while we were at SCAD um there was like a huge drinking culture there I was one of like five who didn't go out and drink and I, I lived like 30 minutes away so I couldn't even really go hang out and I'm a slow drawer so like in the beginning I would have like gone and hung out with them I didn't have like a social problem with them because I didn't know them yet but um I just lived kind of far away and I was always redoing my projects to try and get a better grade and to try to learn from it and I just didn't have the time to do that and um it just the drinking culture got really bad and a lot of people I went to school with ended up with really bad drinking problems and some of them are trying to work on that and I'm cheering for them um, as somebody who had a parent who was an alcoholic you know I know how hard that can be and I know for some of them the socially extreme social anxiety that a lot of us face the alcohol kind of makes you think makes that not as loud in your brain so I, I get it and I'm compassionate to them but I feel like a lot of how we were treated while we were at SCAD encouraged that and then we were encouraged to do that to network and to talk to editors and um, it was just not really like a great environment for comics it wasn't a great environment for neurodivergent people it wasn't a good environment for people with depression issues it was horrifically hard I had a couple of friends who had like 
worse systemic health issues than I did. Like one of them was a phenomenal illustrator, but he had a heart defect and he had to duck out after like a semester and a half because the pace was literally killing him. And I have another who did permanent damage to their hand because the pace, I mean, I did too, but like theirs is worse than mine. They've had surgery on it. Uh, they did permanent damage to their hand because they couldn't keep up with the pace that SCAD dictated. And like, in terms of the pace, that was considered industry standard at the time. If you couldn't do that, then you, in their teaching mindset, then you didn't belong in comics. Like that wasn't a good fit for you if you can't keep up with this workload. So what I want to say um, is not only did going to comics art school make my RSD, just from our interpersonal interactions like it wasn't about my art like I had plenty of negative things said about my art I had plenty of critique given about my art I I'm not talking about that like I needed to improve and I wanted to improve I'm talking about the personal level stuff like like my professors love to use me as a Judas goat because I dress pretty and I was on the podcast and I was very girly girl at the time and they love to use that to bring in like 19 year old girls who wanted to draw shoujo but at the same point I had several professors tell me that if I spent more time working on my art and less time getting dressed in the morning, I would be a better artist. So I wore dresses, like a dress is a one piece of clothing that you don't have to like match with stuff. Like anybody who's worn a dress knows that dresses are kind of like easy mode uh, for people who wear dresses, right? But I would have professors tell me that. Like that was annoying, they would see that in front of everybody else. Like they had no problem making it personal when there was no reason for it to be personal. Yet, at the end of class, they would try to bully me into leading another tour on my time and my dime, because I was paying to be there. I wasn't paid for the tours that I gave. I wasn't compensated for the time I spent talking to teachers and students. I did that because I, at the time, was really proud of um, being a comic artist. I was proud of being a woman in comics. I really wanted to normalize that. I wanted there to be more women in comics. And I wanted to change SCAD for the better. And I thought that if I exemplified the sort of diversity that I wanted to see, just what I could on my end, that we might start to see that change. And like, if you've been to SCAD since and you had a different experience, please let me know. Um, because like, I'd like to know if it's changed. I've talked to people who have graduated since and it's always wild because like the professors who are really horrible to me, they love those professors. And then the professors that I loved, they didn't like those professors. So it's always like, wow. Um, just interesting that different people can have different experiences. But when I graduated from SCAD in 13, I was working freelance for a company that worked with Lego and I loved I loved working with them. I was way at the bottom of the totem pole, but they were always really good to me. I loved the IPs that we were working with. I liked my point of contact. He was really nice. Like that was a really positive experience. And thank God I had that because SCAD had left me shattered. I almost didn't walk when I graduated because I just felt so like embarrassed and ashamed of myself. And I had, I'd made A's. Like my grades were good, uh, but I hated like, I left SCAD with a huge hatred of myself that I have not experienced to that extent before or since. So while I was at SCAD, I was actually injured several times. Um, I stepped on glass and cut up my foot, couldn't take any time off from classes for that. And then I had a spider bite go necrotic. And uh, the only time the wound clinic could fit me in was during one of my classes and I couldn't miss any classes for that either. And I had a professor call me a liar. He was like, you get hurt a lot. And uh, didn't he thought I was doing it for attention. He said it in front of everybody. And this was a, t a professor I'd actually really liked and looked up to and he just said it like it was nothing. Um, and that really, like I, uh, the reason I was getting hurt a lot was because I wasn't getting enough sleep. I was putting myself in somewhat risky situations trying to juggle because they also really wanted us to put ourselves out there and talk to editors and go to conventions. So I was, me and my friends from SCAD were traveling every weekend to go to these shows to do these things, sometimes representing SCAD in official capacity, not getting paid for that, of course, and they didn't pay for any of our airfare either, but we were officially representing SCAD. And uh, then I would hurry back home on very little sleep and get back to working on classes and show up to class the next morning. So I, looking back on it, it's like, of course I got hurt a lot. I was 
not sleeping enough. So like the reason I tell you guys all this is I want to say like it really, I think a lot of art schools have similar mentalities, at least during that time period, especially comics art schools. So I think a lot of us were really indoctrinated in the get underpaid and you just accept that because that's part of the industry. That's just part of life. You gotta, you gotta eat dirt for 20 years before you can start eating McDonald's. Um, you have to be able to pump work out quick. Uh, what was it? Nice, fast and good was what we constantly had drilled in our heads. And I, because of what my professors had told me, I had already accepted that I was probably never going to be good enough. So in that time period, I really focused on being really nice, being a yes woman. Yes, 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 of course. Yes, I'll do that for you. Yes, I'll do that. Yes, I'll volunteer. Yes, I'll help organize this. Yes, 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 of course. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, you want me to, to drive editors around town and entertain them? Yes, of course. Thank you so much. I'm delighted by the opportunity. You want me to talk to these parents about why their kids should go to SCAD and why it's a safe place, even though I have been assaulted by homeless people twice walking to my car and a three month period because we don't hire enough security and we don't have parking lots. Yes, of course I'll talk to these parents. Oh, you want me to mentor these students for free and not get paid for it and help get their grades up? Yes, yes, of course, of course I'll do that. You want me to teach these presentations on dressing presentably and on preparing a convention, an artist alley table? Yes, of course I'll do that. Of course, of course. I couldn't say no. I always said yes. And that really tied into like, I'm an eldest child. Um, I helped raise my younger brother. I had a parent who was an alcoholic. So like the really, 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 I don't know if it was done intentionally, but I was like the target demographic for that. Um, and I remember them bragging that the secretary of the CEQA department had been a CEQA MFA who loved it so much. She just stayed and was their secretary. And I can't help but wonder if I was being groomed for a similar not our public facing comics position, a comics wife. Um, because I had a lot of professors and even the head of the department say things like that, that I should consider instead being like a comics ambassador or working in marketing for comics or being an editor, but they weren't gonna provide any training on how to do those things. So I never really took those things seriously. So um, I really feel like my time at SCAD and those experiences, especially always being second fiddle and expected in a way to serve my male classmates, um, I really think that groomed the mindset. Um, and during the Me Too movement, I actually spoke out a little bit about some of the sexual harassment that was going on at SCAD. And I was warned that I was gonna be blacklisted. And I, th I think, I think that actually happened because in the years since talking to editors or people who have worked as editors, because editors often frequently cycle out, I've had several people tell me that they were warned against working with me because I was high maintenance and I was the B word and like, like the actual B word and um, that I was just really difficult to get along with and that I, right? like that I complained a lot and it was like, well, you've never met me. And at the time my social media really didn't reflect that. And it still really doesn't reflect that overall. And it was like, well, who did you talk to? Well, we talked to somebody who said they went to school with you at SCAD. And it's like, all right, I gotcha. So um, I'm pretty sure I got somewhat blacklisted. And of course, you know, that used to like really bother me. And I used to really regret having ever said anything, which is, you know, when people do things like that, as someone who grew up with um, with an abusive family member and who grew up being physically abused as a child at the babysitters, like that's what they want. Of course, that's what they want. They want to keep you quiet. They want to keep you compliant. They would rather you not exist than you exist or you exist with a voice. So, um, I don't think it was like an organized or concerted effort. I think one of my classmates didn't like me and told everybody about it. Um, maybe they were one of the classmates that I had been complaining about being like kind of gropey at some of the events that were put on. They were organized by students, but they were ostensibly SCAD events, but they were like always at bars. So maybe that is what was going on. I don't know because nobody ever wants to like tell. So that's another problem with comics is we've got like a really, We've got a really bad abuse 
situation sort of mentality where nobody wants to tell the full story. No one wants to name any names. No one wants to talk because we're all super afraid we'll never be hired again. And I basically accepted <laughs> like five years ago when I moved or before, right before I moved back to Louisiana, which is kind of, it's real rough to work in comics when you live in Louisiana. Um, I kind of accepted that that was going to be my case. Like, like this was my life now and I just had to make the best of it. So, um, I want to talk about it, not because I want to put Scout on blast. That was over 10 years ago. I really sincerely hope things have changed over there. Not because I want to put any of those professors on blast. I didn't name any names. I didn't name any of my classmates names. If you feel called out, I promise probably nobody else knows who I'm talking about. Um, it's because I want to see it change and I realize us never talking about these experiences, us never talking about these things keeps the people who benefit from our silence in positions of power where they can make all the decisions and it keeps those of us who are being affected by this disenfranchised. And it's been 10 years and I'm flipping sick of seeing this keep going. Um, so waking up to the comics broke me hashtag was both like cathartic and other people had the same experiences that I had. I'm not just this horrible broken person who deserves to be treated poorly and deserves to be talked down to and deserves to have all of my work minimized as much as possible. But it also really frustrated me because it's like, it's been 10 years. I blacklisted myself talking about this years ago and nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. We're not, in, we're not, we're not organizing, we're not advocating, we don't have any kind of good representation, like nothing has changed. So uh, yeah, I'm making a vlog about it because that's super going to help. But I feel like I spend a lot of time here on the channel and have over the decade encouraging you to make comics, encouraging you to make art. And I feel like I would be remiss to not talk about some of the downsides, not so that you can look at it and say, oh, I don't want to do that, but so that you can look at it and say, okay, I'm aware of this. I am not going to let them manipulate me and I'm going to be strong about this. Um, so after I graduated from SCAD, I had this freelance job that I really liked and thank God I had it because it gave, if, so right, right when I graduated from SCAD, I was having some of the worst panic attacks I've had in my entire life. I had quit sleeping. I wasn't eating. I was really, 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 really messed up. And I also could not afford medical treatment for it because I'm comic artist and I didn't make enough money for that. So I was um, working for this freelance company that they treated me really well. No complaints. They were great. I don't think they exist anymore, but they were really wonderful. I was also doing a bunch of conventions because I was doing conventions to earn income, to try and build up a name in the industry so that I would be hireable and to try and build up like a legacy of respect. So, like people would be familiar with me and familiar with my work and would be willing to give me a shot. And also to develop an audience because I thought if I could build up an audience who really enjoyed my work, I could approach a publisher and have a better chance. And like even in my heyday when the blog was going on and my YouTube channel was more popular and people were reading my comic, I still, I would get editors who would tell me like they like my work, but I just wasn't popular enough. Or they like my work, but I need to just show them that I could garner X amount of support in a short amount of time. So like, even on the back end, even trying to do it a different way than what is commonly told with like, you put together a pitch and you put together your 10 pages of comic and you put together your character designs and you pitch it and you pitch it and you pitch it. And by the way, that was not taught at SCAD. What was taught at SCAD was you take an editor out for drinks and you pitch them your comic idea and you schmooze with them and you make them your friend, which as somebody who comes from a family with addiction problems is not a good fit for me. And there's been a real push to take the drinking out of professional comics interactions. Um, I do think as someone who can't really in, indulge in that, who can't really lean into that side, I have lost out on a lot of opportunities, but I also know a lot of female comic artists who have since come forward to say that, the editor they were talking to has sexually harassed or has made advances on them and that it was a bad idea anyway. So like that needs to change about the industry anyway. Um, but you know, you always kind of look at like the decisions you make and you're like, if I was less uptight, would things have gone differently? And it sounds like things were bad 
both ways and I'm really sorry that that happened to those people and I don't think they deserved it whatsoever. I think it is wholly unprofessional of the editor to try to use their position to do that. And I couldn't actually tell you if those editors are still working in the industry or not because we don't name names. Even I'm doing, the, I'm not going to name names. Um, so right after I graduated, I had a couple of editors at a couple of different, about three editors at three different publications who were really, really interested in my work. And one of them was like, in the next couple of years, I'm going to have something for you. We're just waiting for the industry to shift. And this person is a delightful person. Um, I really, really like them. I wish we could have developed like a friendship outside of comics because I think they're great but they had really bad systemic health problems and they had a young child and they decided that they the demands of the comic industry is really hard on editors as well and they decided they were kind of pushed out because of their health issues but they also decided they wanted to spend more time with their child and i think that's a, a very valid decision but i think it's also a shame that we work in an industry where so many of us are really nice kind good-hearted people who just want to make work to communicate with other people and we get pushed out for having children if you're female or for having systemic health issues or just for being a human being um and that's why I think a lot of artists are a little bit like scared of AI generated art because we know we're not valued as humans in what we do. We're just valued for our output and um, we're not valued for the humanity we bring or the experiences we bring or the love we bring. We're not valued for our ability to teach. We're not really valued for our ability to inspire. Those are all bonuses. We, a lot of us have basically been told either by actions or by behavior that we are very replaceable by a machine or by someone else in another country who is going to charge far less or by someone who's 10 years younger than us and doesn't know the ropes. So that is also like a systemic ongoing problem. So I did, I tried doing, and I apologize for the noise. Joseph is weed eating right outside the front door. I'm sitting in the back of the house, but we have an open floor plan house. So you can very easily hear it. I hate that noise. I find it very distracting so if I cover my ears it's so I don't lose my train of thought ADHD and I have a bit of a migraine and I'm in pain this morning from teaching and then working turning around and working a show doesn't that kind of tie into comics has broken me as a person so um I did conventions mostly anime cons for about 10 years um I never really I never wanted to go like hardcore the way some of my friends do I never really wanted to do all the shows I could possibly get into, but I was doing one to two shows a month. I was traveling across the country and uh, that really, 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 really wrecked my health. And I also didn't like how vicious competitive some people were getting in the artist alley, like would smear your name on social media because you got in and they didn't or might uh, cast dispersions about you as a person to try and get you out of the show. How how personal some people would make them getting waitlisted and you getting in in when you didn't even know them. So like you can't tell them why they did or did not get in. Um, I'd also had people who like learned how to convention from some of my vlogs and from some of my blog posts and from my work with how to be a con artist. And I would overhear them talking about gunning for me and we'd never met. Like they never came and introduced themselves. I didn't know their name. I didn't even know what they were selling, but because they were like cat a corner to me, I could hear them talking about wanting to like outsell me. Spoiler friend, it's not hard. So, um, my goals as a convention artist was I had just released volume one of Seven Inch Kara, which is an original graphic novel series with an ADHD coded main character set in Southeast Louisiana. So I wanted to sell those. Um, I also did a lot of commit, a lot of commissions, so many commissions. I was a quick fire commission artist and I prided myself on being able to have a quick and a very inexpensive turnover. I basically figured out a type of drawing I could do that I could offer at a very low price point. And what I was trying to do was the commission market at that point in time had been really wrecked by bad actors who would take your money and run. And I was really trying to work on building up trust and building up faith. I have probably filled hundreds of Ink Chibi, My Little Pony, 
those kind of commissions, I cannot say that most of those people ever followed me on social media or ever engaged with me again. I really, I was hoping I could build up an audience by these interactions and by drawing these people and by like filling this role and trying to be like the helpful convention big sister. And I feel like my knowledge got used and I got forgotten and left behind. And I have to just like accept that because there isn't really much I can do about it, but it breaks my heart that that is the kind of industry we're in where people will take all your knowledge, they'll take all your brushes, they'll learn as much as they can from you and then never mention your name to anyone. I have been told by multiple people that I am everybody's best kept secret when it comes to tutorials and resources that a lot, a lot of people use what I put out there and will never mention my name to anyone. And that obviously that breaks me that breaks my heart and that's comic industry adjacent i've done comic tutorials i've done comic craft tutorials i've done convention tutorials i've helped so many people and i don't i don't feel like i have any friends i don't i feel like i go to a show and no one comes to say hi to me or that's unfair every now and then and that's like the delight that is the highlight that makes my day when someone is like thank you so much for doing these things they were really helpful to me i really enjoyed them i love it i love it so much but I was not able to build a life on that. And it's hard to see because there are a lot of artists here on YouTube who are younger than me, who got started after I did, who were able to build a life doing the same thing I was doing. Um, and they do happen to be a technical better artist than I am. So what can I say? But it is heartbreaking. And it, you know, every day of my life, I think about quitting. Um, and that is something I didn't do when I was just like a 14 year old kid drawing four coma comics in my sketchbook. I never thought about quitting. Um, I used to have so much passion and so much energy and so much joy to vive. And I had so many editors say, oh, you're young. I was 27. Oh, you're, that's not that young. Oh, you're young. You've got plenty of time. And now I'm 37 and nothing has changed. I put out more books under my own work. I have taught more classes. I've done more conventions. I've met more people, but nothing about my life in that regard has changed or improved. I have just ceased to exist to them. They have forgotten that I have existed for younger and shinier people. And unfortunately, in a lot of ways, that is just how this industry is. The artist name is forgettable for a lot of people. Like if you look at picture book, the artist is not credited nearly as often as the author. The artist is not asked to give speeches, the author is. I did a show, it was a library comic con in Nashville a few years ago. And they wanted me to teach a bunch of drawing classes and I, for free. And I was like, okay, but can I be on your author panel too? Cause they were, this is a comic con. They were doing an author panel. All of their authors were prose books. They were not comic artists. I was the only comic artist and the librarian I was dealing with was like, why? Why do you want to be on an author panel? Gee, I don't know. I write my own comic. Gee, I don't know. I have this blog I've written like thousands of entries in. I don't know. I don't know. I'm a creator also who does storytelling and might benefit from being allowed to speak on a panel or your audience who are at a comic con might enjoy hearing a comic creator talk about the writing process of comics. Gee, I don't know. And that's why I like I throw in a, in a way libraries and other art and education institutions under the bus is because comic artists, even when they want to hire someone to teach drawing, we are so secondary to what they're doing. We're not too many of them, not to all of them, but to many of them. We're not real creators. We're not real writers. We're not real to them. These are not real books. And in my fine art video, I talked about how, um, you still see posts on educator Instagram accounts talking about limiting the number of graphic novels your students could read because to encourage them to read prose books because graphic novels aren't real books. That is still a problem. There are still so, so I was at a show last night, a show put on by Red Stick Cares. Um, I really enjoyed my time there. Don't mean to like, but I had so many parents pick up Seven Inch Care of Volume One, which is a graphic novel, and be like, yeah, but I want to encourage them to read books with words. And I'm over here, like, as a neurodivergent person, and they're talking about their neurodivergent kid, like, comics are so good for neurodivergent kids. I did my master's thesis on how comics support reading, and we're still doing this. We're still, we've still got that mindset. So, like, of course, of course, comics 
has broken me. The response, like I went, I went mostly indie for a lot of reasons. Like uh, so many editors have been like, okay, we would love this if it wasn't set in Louisiana. We would love this if the main character was a boy. We find that since she's a girl, we're going to alienate our male readers. We would love this if it was in black and white and not color. It would be cheaper to produce. We would love this if you could get this to us in six months. If you can get us start to finish Soup to Nuts, a brand new comic in six months, we've got a place for you. I had Quattro approached me years ago. They loved the Nata Soup Studio blog. They wanted to do a book on how to produce comics. And I was on board. I sent them an outline. I was very into it. But the downside was I had a family member who was very sick. So I was flying back and forth to Louisiana and I was about to get married. So I was like, can we do this? And I know publishing time frames, they have set seasons when they can do this, but they gave me a six month time frame to create a brand new how to draw comics book for them. And they were not honest at the get-go about their time frame because they told me two years at the start. And then after I sent the outline, they said six months. So they weren't being honest with me. They, yeah. Anyway, so they took my outline. They handed it to an, another artist who I've never heard of. And that book is out now. And I just get to live with that knowledge. And like part of me is like, well, if I had cranked it out, if I had put off getting married, if I hadn't gone to visit my sick family member, if I had just dedicated my life to putting out this book for Quattro, maybe that would be my name on the book. But like, I don't know Then I would have just, it would have been just another thing in my life that I put off chasing comics and I put off having children to chase comics. I put off moving back to be close to family to chase comics. I put off having friends to chase comics. I put off so many things to chase comics that I don't actually like thinking about it now. I don't regret that. I'm glad that I prioritized being a human being. And I, I even mentioned like, hey, when, when we first talked about this pitch, you said it two, you said two years. Oh uh, yeah, well, you know, the publishing industry moves, they gave me excuses. So like, I'm just gonna be blunt, like that kind of behavior, and I'm not just talking about Quattro, but I mean like this like expectation that we as artists can just crank it out. We'll, we'll just pull six all-nighters in a row. We don't need sleep. Food, food is for suckers. I'm just gonna drink smoothies and soylents. The, the idea that we're going to do that for you so you can make money from that project and then we will promote the heck out of it on our social media and get all of our people to buy it with a time frame of nothing is super disrespectful. Just like it's disrespectful when um, NCE was, I was teaching a six week how to make comics course where they were producing mini comics and zines at the end of the six weeks and we had a zine exchange. And I, I had some difficulty filling the class to be real because it was very reliant on my social media account. It was very reliant on me going to Rick's uh, comic shop and to Great Escape and to the local bars and to the local comic shops and putting out physical flyers. Um, but it was disrespectful that they couldn't even use the footage that they had recorded of me when I showed up pro bono on my account to one of their events to give them that footage so they could use to promote it. They wouldn't even use it. That is kind of disrespectful. It's disrespectful of um, libraries when <laughs> When uh, I tell them I need to charge X amount of money because it takes me two weeks to prep a class and um, you guys wanted a brand new class. This is based on what y'all asked for. It's going to take me two weeks of working on this steadily to do it. And they don't want to pay me the dip. They don't want to pay me the $10 pay bump I asked for, for for developing a brand new class for them. And the check is for $10 less than what we discussed. Like that's kind of disrespectful. And I don't know how to advocate for myself. And I went to comic school thinking I was going to learn how to negotiate contracts and how to advocate for myself. And all I was taught was to be nice, to be fast, and to be good. To not advocate and to take whatever options I have because there might not be better options. And that sounds so much like my dad's mom in the 1950s when she was divorced and had two sons and was willing to take the next guy who could help pay the bills and help raise her sons because she had no options. And I don't think the people, the, the women in my life have sacrificed so much to raise a daughter who is willing to take 
$15 for an illustration that took me three days to work on, you know? But that's the mindset that is so pervasive. And it's so weird because out of one side of the mouth, they're saying, oh, you ought to charge more and you need to charge more. Art has value. They won't tell you what. They won't tell you what you should be charging. They won't tell you what you're worth. They won't help you work on that. But on the other side of the mouth, they'll tell you you don't deserve to ask for more, you should take whatever opportunities you can get because the next one might not come along. And that's comics. Like, I'm not saying comics is the only industry that does it, but that's comics. So even before I was at SCAD, but while I was at SCAD, the majority, so SCAD, SCAD story time. So we were expected as MFAs to do an internship. They did not negotiate our internships. They did. They may have for some students, but the vast majority of us were on our own. We had to negotiate our, our own internships. We had to pay SCAD $3,000 for this internship class that was not organized by SCAD, that was not hosted by SCAD, that was not on SCAD time, that was not with SCAD resources. We theoretically had a mentoring professor who was also not paid for mentoring us. That was done pro bono. Mine was done at two local schools. One of them was an elementary school. It was inner city. It had very, very little money. And the other was at the local charter school that was ostensibly public, but it was all SCAD professors, kids. And they had way too much money and the art supplies, they had way too many art supplies and they would just rot in the closet rather than go to the inner city school. And that was an internship myself and the friend who was also student teaching we were co-student teaching at the time we negotiated that we finagled that we were our i was the transportation that was my car and my gasoline every morning um and yet we paid scad three thousand dollars for that and like apparently that is not legal to do you cannot charge for an internship that well you can't charge for an internship um and we were not paid by the school for our time and the teacher I taught under thought a great use of our time would be organizing her closets. She taught at both schools, organizing the closet at her inner city school, organizing the closet at the charter school. And then, and then she sheared us out, MFAs in art. She sheared us out to the other teachers so we could organize their closets too. And when I pointed out to her that my mom was a teacher, my aunt was a teacher, I come from a family of teachers, I would like to learn how to teach she she was like okay you're right i am you are i am kind of wasting your time with this so what i did was not only did i teach my full day i would stay after school for two hours to help students prepare their portfolios so they could get into the art high school um i don't know why i'm sharing that story other than like mess messy but like i never really really wanted to be a teacher i enjoy teaching i like doing the blog i like doing youtube i like teaching individuals i love teaching individuals i love seeing other people's art and being able to help them but like my my game plan in life was not become a professional teacher that's why i didn't go to school for specifically teaching that's why i don't hold a degree in teaching um but i know a lot of comic artists end up gig teaching because even though it does not pay very well. I'll be, I'll be tra really transparent with you guys. I charge $75 an hour. I would like to charge 85 an hour for inflation. It takes me a week to prep a class. I usually bring all the materials. I'm also bringing a boatload of knowledge with me. Um, it is really hard to get people to pay for that. When I was teaching for the little art house in Nashville, they charge $150 per student per class session. I saw... I think I was getting paid 75 for that. They did provide the location. They provided some of the materials, but I provided the rest of the materials and I provided all of the education and all of that content. Um, so like, I know my point with that is I know there are parents who are willing to pay more for private art lessons. I don't necessarily see that in what I do now. To be fair, I do teach a lot with libraries and those classes are free for the students. The library and taxpayer money pays for what I do, but I also know they will turn around and pay other teachers a lot more. So here's part, the reason I bring this up is I was having trouble making ends meet. I have family members who are very sick and they are financially strapped and I would like to earn enough money that I can help them. I've mentioned before that I'd like to earn enough money to be able to pay my mom to help me when I prep for shows and to help me when I 
prep for classes. She's doing it for free and she doesn't ask for any money, but she's financially strapped and I would really like to be able to help her. And I don't make enough money to do that. And um, I asked on Twitter, like, hey, gig teachers, what are you charging? No one would answer me. Um, I have 2K followers and nobody would say anything. My husband reached out to a mutual friend who is a, an, he's a comic artist and he teaches and he responded privately and he gets paid $400 per class. Now this is someone who has about 10 years of experience over me. So like, I'm not saying he doesn't deserve it, but like I get paid $75, he gets paid $400. There is no transparency in what we do. I provide almost all of the materials for this last class I taught. I went and spent 85 bucks on paint for my students. I spent, oh, I bought three pads of Blick Studio watercolor paper for them. So I think that's around $75 now with inflation. Um, I let them use my watercolor brushes. You know, like I, they, they always flirt about compensating me for what I buy and then I never get the check to compensate me for those materials. So, but I think transparency and us uh, actually working together and talking together would help a lot. When I was more involved in the con scene, I used to, in, I used to organize con dinners where I would go and invite a bunch of people from the artist alley and we'd all have dinner together and we would talk about what worked and what didn't work and cons we liked and like that kind of community is really important. That kind of community really empowers people. That kind of community allows us, I mean, it's like a union, right? We can negotiate for better rates. We can price our work in a way that is competitive so that everyone can earn more money. Like it could be a win-win situation. Hi! And like, I know the Screen Actors, sorry, Screen Actors Guild has a guild they work together some people like it some people don't um i know animation has a guild comics has talked about unionizing for decades and we just we just can't we just can't get our work together you have the ones who only want to unionize for people who work for big publishers like scholastic or boom um and they don't care about web comics and I think that's where we always peter out is like we don't have a cohesive plan and then I'm not even going to really talk too much about like web comics um I'm an artist who decided I was not I don't care for the infinite scroll format I don't care for it as a reader I don't care for it as an artist um I have friends who do beautiful work in that format it's just not really for me so like from the get-go tapastic and webtoons were just not really going to be good fits for me that was not a direction I wanted to go in um, but I have seen so much from artists who have felt burned or misused or taken advantage of by those platforms, like web comics need unions too, if only so that when our readers who are reading our comics for free, get ugly with us in the comments about how we don't update enough, if only so that we feel empowered not to take that personally and to, to maybe just a, that's rude of them to do, but B, I'm really glad you enjoy the story. Um, we really need that kind of solidarity. We need to have solidarity for comic artists who are content creators, who create tutorials and create resources and want to teach the next generation. We need to teach those who are coming after us to respect the people, have some respect, some admiration for the people who came before them and not just take them for granted. Um, I really think Species spicy hot take that we are our own worst enemy because so many of us have social anxiety so many of us are neurodivergent so many of us have really bad anxiety and depression issues we have a really 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 hard time socializing with one another and a lot of us have imposter syndrome and rsd that it makes it hard to be around other comic artists because we're always comparing ourselves to other people without knowing the full story i think in this regard we are our own worst enemy yes these companies, these publishers, and if you look at the comics broke me hashtag, you will see a lot of stories. Some are more detailed than others because some people are still working and don't want to be blacklisted. They don't want to be fired. And they'll be very honest about they're afraid that by saying anything, they'll be fired, which is also depressing and horrific. I think, I mean, obviously these companies that are preying upon our desire to make art and preying upon society's conception of if you get to make an artist 
If you get to be an artist, whether you make money or not, you're lucky. You get to draw. You get to draw for a living. You're so lucky. Can't pay your bills. You're still so lucky. Shut up. Quit complaining. Your parents are poor and you'd like to help them out. Shut up. Quit complaining. You can't afford your transition. Shut up and quit complaining. You're an artist. You get to draw. Wow. So lucky. You get to draw. Um, you know, we don't, we don't say that to doctors. Wow. You get to do surgery. You're so lucky. You get to save lives. That must be so fulfilling. Why do we pay you? We do say that to teachers though. I hear that. And, uh, I grew up hearing my mom get told that of, oh, oh, but you get to work with kids. That's so fun. Like, yeah. Do you know how much time, how, how much time they have sacrificed that they're not being compensated for to teach your child who can't even bother to bring a pencil to class? Mm, so, so, so good. We love, we love it. And that's the crap thing is like, there are aspects we really, 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 really love that we would die for. And we don't want to lose those, whether it's teaching or whether it's art there. I had, I had a class with art squad where they did a critique and they critiqued my art and they were so good. They had such good, valid areas I could improve upon, ideas for things I could do in the future. They were so good at that. And then they brought me, some of them brought up their sketchbooks of their own volition for, for my advice. And I would not trade that for the world. That's why I teach and that's why I make art. I love that community. I love being able to help other people and to be helped in return. I love that. Would not trade that. But on the other hand, we have those things we love and I'm not talking about Art Squad. I'm not talking about St. Charles Parish here. We have those things we love weaponized against us and used against us of, oh, but you're so lucky. You get, you get to do this. Like we haven't sacrificed things. Like we haven't given up things. Like we, there aren't other things we could have done with our lives um, that we should just be grateful just for the chance to exist like this heaven forbid you ask for anything in return, let alone even a modicum of respect. And I think so many of us are so intensely afraid of losing the good that we won't speak up against the bad. And y'all, as a victim of abuse, as someone who has survived that, nothing will change. When I was 14, my parents got divorced. And most of the guys I have dated, minus my husband, came from families where the parents divorced and where the dad jetted. The dad was done, had a second family, loved the second family, had nothing for his son, could not even pay child support. Some of these guys had rich dads and their dads wouldn't pay child support. And um, I was terrified my dad was going to do that because my dad was an alcoholic and all he did when he was drinking was talk about how awful my mom was and how awful I was because we had the nerve to tell him that his alcoholism and his rage fits were hurting us. And um, they got divorced and it, he moved out, but he like only moved down the road. So I got to see my dad a lot. And that divorce was one of the best things that happened to me because my dad, the time spent away from us where he had to reflect on his own decisions and where he had to suffer the consequences of his choices. He sobered up and he and I reconnected. We spent a lot of time together. Uh, we were able to have a much better relationship. I was able to forgive him for a lot of what I went through as a child. And then when he developed lung cancer when I was in my 20s, my mom took him back in and uh, I got to spend a lot of time with my dad even though I was in college and my parents didn't, they wouldn't let me drop out. I wanted to drop out for that year to be with my dad while he was dying and they were like, please do not do that. Um, so I only got to see my dad on weekends and I had to share him with family. I really, I had to share him with his sister who I really don't like. Um, and uh, anyway, it was one of the best things that ever happened because I was so afraid he was going to stop loving us. I was so afraid he was going to find something better and move on and he didn't. And he changed and he became a better person. And it taught me that standing up for yourself, and it's hard for me to do this because Skag kind of dumped a load of garbage on top of that, but standing up for your own rights and to be treated like a person and to be treated with respect and to be treated with care can sometimes pay off in such a beautiful way and all of us are so dang afraid to do that. We're so scared to say, I can't draw 16 hours a day for you for $75 a page. Like that is ridiculous. 
the publishing industry, maybe we need to slow our horses. Maybe we need to slow our roll. There are so many new comics that are just coming out, coming out, coming out, coming out. Their readers can't keep up with it. And since the pandemic, um, well, during the pandemic, comic readership rose, but it slumped again. Maybe you should just give us more time to make good things and give us the money to do it. So that instead of like starving to death and working three jobs and watching our parents die, we could support ourselves, support our families and draw beautiful things for you. I don't know. Like the only reason I can do a watercolor comic is because I'm not doing it for a publisher. Because if I had to do a comic for a publisher, I'll be real, I'd have to tap out. My RA is too bad right now. My migraines are too bad right now. I just could not do it. I might have beautiful ideas and beautiful things to say to people, but I just can't keep up with that pace. And I was really wondering if maybe I was just too broken as a person to be in comics anymore. That like, I have felt for a decade now that there's no place for me in comics. Nobody wants me in comics. I don't have anything to say that anyone cares about. And then waking up to comics broke me and seeing people I thought had it made. People I thought had a good life. People whose names are all over all kinds of comics. And they seem like they got it together. Bringing up the same things I deal with made me feel like a maybe I haven't got it so super bad and also so sad and so angry that things have continued in this vein for so long and we're so afraid to speak up so like I'm saying this because um in a way I have very little to lose all right I like teaching with my libraries I like working with them I like coming in and showing their patrons things their patrons ostensibly not always the case ostensibly want to learn how to do i love working with art squad i get to work with almost the same teenagers every week or every month we are getting to learn each other's work i'm getting to help them in a salient way i'm helping them pursue the kind of art they want to make i love that i love getting to teach i wish i got to teach more how to make comics like writing comics big comics classes um, because when, when it comes to comics programming, they always just want make a mini comic because it's like wham, bam, done. Um, but I like getting to teach the next generation how to make comics. I like getting to teach people my age and older who are interested in watercolor, how to watercolor in maybe a way that might, I tend to throw too much information at them, but that's because I assume they're as hyper-focused as I am and I need to work on that. Um, so I like that. I really like that. I don't want to lose that. I am definitely afraid that by mentioning I'm not getting paid fairly for my time and my work and mentioning that it is frustrating to be not given the resources or not have the resources I need made accessible that I have to go out and buy them or I have to find them. I have to supply them that those are frustrating. It is sad that I feel like I can't bring up those two points because I will be discarded. And I have had employers discard me for less than that. NCE was done with me and found someone else to teach comics when I was like, I can't keep doing this for this amount of money. This is not enough money for six weeks of work. I can't keep doing this. They just found somebody else to replace me. I didn't get a goodbye. I didn't get a thank you for all the fish. I didn't get any kind of recognition for the work that I put in. And that is all of gig teaching pretty much. There's never any thank yous. Um, so in Ascension, they apparently fill out uh, feedback forms for the library. I don't get to see those feedbacks. I don't know if someone loved a class. I don't know if someone struggled with a class. I don't know how I can improve. I am expected to just figure it out. Um, and I don't know if they don't wanna share that feedback with me because they're afraid of losing me if a patron had some feedback that I don't wouldn't respond well with. So like there are in the arts, there's so many communication issues that keep all of us from doing our best work. And there's trust, a lot of us have bad trust issues because we've been taken advantage of professionally and we're really afraid to be honest with our, with our concerns. And we don't necessarily feel like, based on past experiences or based on current experiences, that we can talk to our employers. Like y'all don't even know. With, with some of these libraries, I'm always like, hey, I'd love to meet up in person and we could talk about our upcoming classes. And some of these libraries can't ever make time for me or it takes nine months 
for me to talk to the head of that type of programming about the next four classes I'm going to teach for them. They can't even make 15 minutes to sit down and talk to me about it face to face. Like, so I bring this up not to throw my, the libraries under the bus because I'm really, really happy I get to do art programming for them. Um, it is more to say, I feel like this is larger than just the comic industry. It's almost like everything comics touches, everything that has the word comic associated, including the comic artist. There are problems that we need to work on. And I'm actually working with my therapist about rebuilding my confidence, working on my RSD, advocating for myself, trusting my employers enough that when there's a problem, I can talk to them about it. And all of these problems came from my time at SCAD and after, my time getting an MFA in comics and after. So, um, I, I hope, I don't know. Some people will be like, Becca, that sure was a rant. And I wasn't really like trying to rant. I was more trying just to like share my own lived experiences in some ways kind of poorly. Didn't do the best job really explaining things to y'all. Because like convention life as a comic artist, especially anime con convention art life as a comic artist is rough. It is rough. Um, I don't want to like get into some things too much because I really don't want to be, I don't want to, I don't want the response to just be sour grapes. And even reading comics broke me, even reading responses from people that I'm familiar with their work and I have a lot of respect from them. And then you have people responding to, that wasn't my experience. Maybe you're just not good enough. That wasn't my experience. Maybe you're lying. That wasn't my experience. Maybe you're just sour grapes. Like I'm not here for that. I don't want that. I don't want to see that. If you had a better experience, that's wonderful. Maybe you're doing something differently. Maybe your editor is a different kind of editor. I don't know. There's so many variables. And and because all of us are so quiet about what we do and so many of us are, are kind of ashamed of what we do or how we're treated and we've internalized that treatment as being a reflection of ourselves and our worth rather than somebody else's messed up preconceived notions about what comics are or aren't without even having read any in the past 20 years. Um, uh, that I don't want to paint a wide brush. I don't want to say this is indicative of all comics. This is indicative of all gig art teaching. This is indicative of everyone. These are my personal experiences. They are colored by the way I was raised. They were colored by the abuse I endured. They were colored by my experiences while I was at SCAD as me, this specific person. They are colored as a person with ADHD and RSD. There's so many variables that all I I would ask is that you accept that these were my experiences and I that I actually experienced and that my experiences were valid just as your experiences are valid if you resonate with what I said if you feel commonality with what I said maybe we should communicate maybe we should work together and collaborate and maybe we can help make comics and the surrounding industries including art education and content creation a little bit easier on all of us. I mean, it really kind of makes me sad to see that um, like animator, anime commenters and comic commenters, their channels do way better than animators who are talking about animation or comic artists who are talking about making comics. Like the education side gets snoozed on, but the commentary side gets a lot of views. And that kind of bums me out. Like even that, we could be talking about it. And finding ways to talk about it that don't denigrate that side of things for their popularity, but instead uplift and support and encourage our side of things for the things that we're doing that do indeed have a positive impact on, this, on the world around us or seek to have a positive impact on the world around us. So um, if you are also a comic artist, please share your experiences. I am always interested. I'd love to actually talk to you and get to know you. I feel like every year more of my comic friends are just like, I'm done. I'm done. This is horrible. I'm done. Finish. On that note, not to put anybody on blast. I hope that isn't what comes from this. When I was part of Ink Drop Cafe, I really loved being in a community with other comic artists. We didn't always get along. We often butted heads, but I liked the community aspect of it. I miss that so much. But we 
had enough bad actors, we had enough people in our Discord who were actively soliciting a fight because they had stuff going on in their life and th they needed to take it out on somebody and they were going to take it out on us. We had enough bad actors within even our collective who were not doing the things they said they were going to do in the sign-up agreement that when my co-founder got tired of being treated like garbage despite doing many wonderful helpful things and wanted to shudder even though i wasn't ready to say goodbye to the collective i wasn't ready to lose the community i couldn't disagree because like you're right they're treating you super poorly and it's embarrassing and some of them are treating me super poorly also and it's embarrassing and we can't even agree on booting out the ones who are bad actors because the ones who are super rude to me are super nice to you and vice versa and it's hard to come to a consensus and I feel like that can be kind of endemic of comics in general so um I just kind of wanted to share my experiences if it is something you have struggled with yourself I hope that you found a little solidarity in my experiences if your experiences were the exact opposite and have been sunshine and flowers and friendship and roses that is wonderful use that energy to help make comics a better place for the rest of us make sure the rest of us are having seats at the table make sure the rest of us have food on your plates use your position of privilege to help out other people instead of commenting on their twitter uh, tweets about their negative experiences to be like well I didn't have that experience maybe if you were a better artist like I don't know maybe use that privilege to uplift other people gee or use your experience to teach other people how to do what you're doing YouTube is full of like I made 80k selling art in six weeks and um yeah, that ain't me y'all that ain't me that ain't me that ain't me that ain't me I did a show last night with like mostly neurodiv people selling my neurodiv comics and I made 60 bucks, you know, like not, not every experience is going to be super shiny, awesome. And we shouldn't just uplift and champion the, the most aspirational of experiences. I think even the bad experiences have some meat on their bones and some validity to them that is worth listening and hearing and considering. And when we put the earphones on and we only listen to the best experiences and we assume that's going to be us, we're kind of setting ourselves up for failure because realistically that's maybe one out of 10, maybe one out of 10 people. And I promise, I thought that was going to be me and that wasn't me. It's probably not going to be you, but if we work to listen to other people's experiences and uplift and support other people, we can level that playing field so that more people can at least find an equilib equilibrium. And we don't have such varied, like, it was super great, wonderful, 10 out of 10 would change nothing. And one out of 10, I am so miserable. This is so rough, but I'm afraid to say anything because I might lose that little 1%, that little one out of 10% that I already have. Like, Maybe we can level the playing field so everybody's got a little bit of something and everybody's being treated with the respect that human beings deserve to be treated with and everyone is earning a living and fair wage for their work and talent. Because I promise you, if every single comic artist walked away from their publishers for our terrible pay rates, they would have to raise their rates. But I also 110% understand taking those $75 pages because you have rent to pay. You have a cat who is at the vet right now and is very sick. You have a partner who is transitioning. Like people have real things going on in their lives. And I am absolutely, as a commission artist who used to do $15 ink chibis because I had a cat who had expensive vet problems I am not judging you for the rates that you're willing to take. I'm not. I'm not. I've been there. I am still there. I charge 75 an hour, a teaching hour. It's not 75 a prep hour. I don't get paid for all those prep hours. I don't get paid for showing up 15 minutes early. I don't get paid for staying 15 minutes after. I don't get paid for cleaning up. I don't get paid for what I've printed out. I get paid for the teaching hour I'm there. And if a library two hours away books me for just one hour. I just got paid $75. I didn't get paid for gas. I didn't get paid anything else. So like, I'm not judging you at all. I want to find a solution. 
where more of us can eat and more of us can pay our bills and more of us can afford to do this for a living because frankly, so many people shouldn't be killing themselves for an amount of money that is hobby levels of amount of money. Our system is broken, it is not serving us. Our industry is broken, it is not serving us. And I think we all deserve to be treated a little bit better, right? So I hope this was, um, I hope you guys enjoyed hanging out with me. I've got a bit of a headache. I'm not really feeling great from yesterday. Yesterday was rough. It was rough, the class was rough and then the, the show was kind of a lot of work and not a lot of money. So yesterday was kind of rough. And my RA is already like, girl, you cannot. So, you know, I, I guess I'm coming from this as someone who has wrecked her body and wrecked her health, chasing a dream and not getting, my husband has been my support, but like not getting the support that would help me succeed and seeing a lot of other really wonderful artists not getting the support that they need to succeed either. And this isn't me like, I have a Patreon, by the way, uh, this is 1000% not me complaining about them. They are so, so nice to me. So many of them are so kind to me on my discord server and so supportive. I'm not talking about y'all. This is not that I ran a Kickstarter a couple years ago and some of y'all have been so incredibly patient with me. This is not me talking about that either. Absolutely not. Support is more than just a few 50 or so people who are phenomenally kind support is the systems we work in support is acknowledging that work that goes into what we do support is treating us in society with respect and as more than just free babysitting which is where my art teaching career was going for a while was people would dump their kids who don't even like art in my art classes to get rid of them for two hours and it was driving me through the roof because i don't get paid enough for that i don't want to babysit i want to work with young artists who are excited to make art um so hopefully me sharing my experiences and just being like honest and real with you guys will empower you and maybe empower me and maybe we can work together to figure something out. Um, if Comics Broke Me is still going on, I heavily encourage you to just read and consider what other people are saying. This was started in response to, I didn't wanna make this about Ian Baganti because I don't know Oh, I, I knew him, but we weren't super tight and I don't know all the ins and outs. So I don't want to make a bunch of conjecture, but uh, Ian McGinty died recently. Um, his family has not released his cause of death. There is speculation that he died from overwork. Uh, would not surprise me. Ian was, I knew him a little bit from SCAD. Um, all of my experiences with him were very positive. He was always like a really nice guy. He could get along with like anybody it seemed like. He was just like a cool person, you know. Um, I felt like I wasn't cool enough to hang out with him. So I mean, I probably could have hung out more and I just didn't put myself out there. But he was seemed like a super good guy. A very prolific artist. He worked on Hello Kitty. He worked on Being Puppycat. He worked on I private IPs. He worked on Invader Zim. Like he was always working. You never heard him complain. You never heard him say a negative word. I, I mean, I, I was friends with him on like Instagram and Twitter. I, I thought things were going like super duper well for him. Um, and he passed away very suddenly. And like I said, there's conjecture about it being from overwork. And I think that is very telling about our industry that someone who is so, was such a cool person, was so kind to so many people, was kind of like a ray of sunshine and worked so profit, prolifically. He was 38, he, he's a year older than me. And um, his last post on Twitter was like, I just want to make comics with everybody. And his last post on Instagram was like a picture of uh, his spouse hanging out at the pool. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't think th he saw this coming. And I don't know that any of us see this coming and it could be any of us. You know, I've had, when I was at SCAD, I had cluster migraines so bad. I thought I was going to have an aneurysm because my grandfather died of an, and he had three, he died of the last one. And my grandmother on my dad's side died of an aneurysm and my aunt had a bleed. And I was just expected to put myself in a car and drive to class and exist with these cluster migraines. Like, 
like the grind we are expected to put ourselves through and not say anything about we cannot mention the hand pain we cannot mention the headaches we cannot mention the bad back problems because that's considered whining we're expected to wreck ourselves for not even a thank you for no one even knows your name for you go to a convention with the same 30 people you see at every other convention and nobody can remember what your name is like that is rough we are sacrificing ourselves and burning ourselves out and we might not have much to show of it. And I think Ian's death just hit a lot of people really hard. And I'm really hoping his, not that us changing the comics, comics industry would avenge his death or anything like that. But I think Ian was the kind of person who, if we could, as comic artists, get our acts together and work together and advocate for better treatment for everyone, that would be a pretty cool legacy for Ian. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. And um, anyway, hour 30 minutes of me talking about the comics industry from my own very small myopic lens, uh, debating whether I should like tangent and tell you guys about how when anthologies were like a big thing, most of us who contributed to anthologies didn't even get paid a page rate for our work. Like we were doing that for free. Um, or like contributing to zines and getting paid for your contribution is still a kind of revolutionary idea. Like we all operate on the world's most ridiculous margins for other people's enjoyment and joy because so many of us have this driving need to communicate and share that it almost doesn't matter if we even eat that night or if we even get any sleep that night. And y'all, we're burning ourselves out quite literally like candles. We can't, this is not sustainable. This is not fair to us. And if we don't treat ourselves better, then it's no wonder everybody treats ourselves, treats us so poorly. Like I don't go around treating people poorly, but like I can't expect the people I work with to read my mind and be able to facilitate me teaching their comics classes when they don't know the first thing about comics either, you know? So anyway, hour and a half, I am a little, I am a very afraid of my comments section uh, because this is me putting myself out there and being vulnerable and that is a scary thing, but I so sincerely want change. And if I can just change the minds of 130 people, cause let's be real, this video is not gonna get more than 300 views. If I could just change the minds of and educate 130 people, that is 130 people who didn't know it and now they do. And that is at least a something. So take that what you will uh if you would like to share this video in good faith i encourage you to do that if you're just gonna like share this video to hate watch me and talk about the comics has been washed up failure i mean i can't stop you but like that's not really the vibe of this video i hope you guys have a wonderful day if possible uh if you're a comic artist and you can please give yourself a chance to rest because not only does the comic industry want to eat us but social media algorithms eat us also so try to carve some time out for yourself i my migraine is getting really bad so i'll see you guys again later with an art supply review tutorial or maybe even another art chat bye guys